Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you to the Society of Skeletal Radiology Resident Education Club webinar. I'm Adam Zoga from uh, Jefferson in Philadelphia. I've been an SSR member since 2004. I'll be serving as a co-moderator um, for this webinar. Um, I'm thrilled to uh, introduce one of my closest colleagues in sports medicine, Steve Stash, who serves as uh, chief of sports medicine at Jefferson, works with the, uh, the Rothman Institute. We've worked together on multiple professional teams, college teams. Uh, I'm not gonna name them all. I think uh, some of the logos come up. And I'd love to introduce you to my colleague, our speaker tonight, Jeff Belair. Uh, I'm supposed to remind everyone everyone to log into Poll Everywhere, so don't forget to log into Poll Everywhere. Uh, love to introduce you to uh, Jeff Belair, who is an, ass uh, an assistant professor of radiology in our department, soon uh, on his way to promotion. Um, he did our fellowship after, uh, after doing residency at uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and um, he's now the director of our, uh, <clears throat> of our musculoskeletal fellowship. And uh, he's an awesome sports medicine radiologist. Um, so with that, uh, I hope you enjoy the production. And uh, oh, thanks to, uh, thanks to Soterias and his team for inviting us. And thanks to uh, the Veritas crew um, for, uh, for running this webinar. Jeff? Um, again, I'm Jeff Belair, one of the uh, MSK radiologists at Jefferson, also our MSK fellowship director. And I'm joined tonight by... Uh, Dr. Close colleagues, mentors, and uh, and a professor of MSK radiology at Jefferson, as well as um, Dr. Stephen Stash, who's uh, one of my um, colleagues and and uh, friends um, who works for Rothman Orthopedic Institute. Also holds an associate professor position with Jefferson, and is the assistant uh, team physician for um, you know the the three major sports teams in the Philadelphia region. Um, so I have no disclosures um, that are relevant to this uh, discussion, but um, I would like to disclose our, uh, our partners here. So Jefferson and, and Rothman Orthopedics are um, partners of, uh, again, many of the uh, major uh, sports teams and collegiate sports teams in the region. And uh, thus we provide the imaging services um, for all of these uh, athletes. So we're very fortunate to um, you know, to work with our Rothman colleagues uh, uh, and, uh, and also the um, athletic uh, trainers and all the, um, you know, team staff for, uh, for each and every one of these um, uh, groups. So uh, you may have heard of the three A's of uh, physician success. In fact, I think it was brought up maybe last week um, or, or last month at the webinar. Um, and those three A's really apply uh, to imaging as well, right? So the three A's are availability, affability, and ability. And in radiology, really ability is, is accuracy, right? Your ability to um, accurately detect findings on imaging. Availability includes both availability of the scanner um, for the you know, athlete to get scanned and also availability of the radiologist to discuss the findings in a, you know, in, in a quick and efficient manner um, with the relevant parties. Affability, of course, is important for um, developing relationships with our sports medicine and orthopedic colleagues. And certainly um, having your, uh, your orthopedic surgeons and your sports medicine docs uh, on speed dial is, is critically important um, for uh, conveying uh, pertinent findings um, related to uh, athletes and also, um, you know, staying in touch in terms of um, scheduling uh, imaging and uh, scheduling procedures and that sort of thing. So these are just some some photos here that I've thrown in at the top uh, left here. You see uh, Dr. Zoga and uh, a bunch of the Eagles uh, team staff, um, team medical staff here uh, at the combine. Um, down here we have uh, uh, Dr. Stash as well as. Uh, Dr. Dodson um, at one of the Eagles games and, and also on the right here, uh, Steve with uh, Dr. Stash with some of the uh, medical staff at uh, across the pond over at, uh, uh, at the uh, Eagles-Jags game, um, which was uh, held in England. So 
just some neat photos here. This, these are also some photos from the combine. Um, Adam with the uh, with uh, Dougie P here, and uh, and you know some of the other uh, Eagles uh, um, representatives and the medical staff. Um, you'll notice here that there's uh, quite a few of these imaging, um, uh, you know, trailers that are parked uh, next to uh, indoors next to Lucas Oil Stadium, and and these are portable uh, MRI systems actually. So. Um, as part of the, uh, you know, medical examinations for the athletes that are um, participating in the combine, um, they may require on-demand MRI imaging uh, to follow up on previous injuries, um, and, and thus uh, these, these uh, mobile MRI systems are available for, uh, for immediate imaging. So the organi organizational medical team really um, centers around the athlete. Right. The athlete uh, works very closely with the head athletic trainer, um, as well as the you know, other athletic training staff who are in direct communication constantly with the team physicians. Right. So here you have, a, uh, uh, again, a picture of Chris Dodson and, and Barry Keneally, two of the um, team docs for the Sixers. And uh, the team physician will then consult with other specialists, um, one of whom may be a radiologist. Right. So. Um, and then the other side of this is, you know, via the athletic trainer, um, the coaching staff and the general manager are kept in the loop um, who will, uh, you know, if and when necessary, circle back with the uh, athletes. So this is kind of how the, you know, medical team is organized for, a, you know, a major athletic program. And so where does the radiologist, uh, you know, play a role in this? Um, so looking at it kind of from a radiologist centric point of view, the radiologist consults with the team physician, right? But the radiologist also needs to communicate with the AT um, and in some cases, um, the athlete themselves, right? As they're coming in for their imaging, um, if they're coming in for any sort of interventional uh, procedure, um, treatment, that sort of thing. Uh, and also hospital administration, right? So these athletes are you know, gonna be seen and imaged discreetly in order to avoid you know, the fanfare and media that may be associated with them uh, entering the, uh, the facilities. Um, and then the radiologist will also consult with other specialists, right? So maybe not necessarily the team physician, but if there's another consultant on the case, um, you know, for example, a, a hand surgeon or a foot and ankle specialist or um, you know, like a, a hip arthroscopist, the radiologist may need to um, may need to consult with and, and discuss imaging findings with any of the consultants that are involved in the care of the specific athlete. And in certain instances, the radiologist may also need to um, communicate um, things directly with either the coaching staff or the GM. So the radiologist really plays a very crucial role in imaging of the athlete. And in fact, um, really serves as a, essentially as an athlete imaging manager, right? So the, the radiologist, in addition to the things that I mentioned, including, you know, registering, making sure that the uh, athletes registered correctly with hospital administration, making sure that the billing's taken care of and, and scheduling is not an issue, um, the, you know, that the, the players fit into the schedule, um, but also to serve essentially as a technologist, right? Protocoling the, the study, um, in particular, you know, MRI studies, uh, and, uh, and QAing those studies to make sure that there aren't, um, you know, any issues with the study before the patient gets off the table. Um, and then, you know, making sure that image transfer happens when necessary. Um, and again, making sure that the, um, the, you know, the athletes image discreetly. And, and again, there's no fans or media that are um, around that could potentially, um, you know, disrupt, uh, the, you know, the athlete's medical care. So oftentimes they're ushered, you know, into the facility through a back door or something like that. Right. So one of the really important things and one of the questions um, that we often try to help answer with imaging is uh, what the anticipated return to play for a specific injury might be. Right. So the, the, we think about this as a trifecta of return to play. And uh, since uh, today is 420, um, this will be the only 420 reference uh, for any of you Pineapple Express fans uh, here, but, but really the three things of return to play are, can the player return quickly? Can the player return at maximal performance? 
and can they return with a low risk of re-injury, right? But there's many other factors that are um, that are at play with you know with a player potentially returning, right? There are social pressures that the player may feel. Um, there are monetary considerations, right? If a player's uh, due for a contract extension um, or some sort of incentive bonus, um, those may impact their you know psychological um, impulses to to try and return to play quicker, right? Um, team dynamics, uh, you know the 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 player is part of a team, right? And so oftentimes they they want to return as quickly as they can to help their teammates. Competitiveness, right? If the if the team is in a position where they're making a playoff run or in the playoffs, um, that may affect how quickly a player returns, um, and uh, you know obviously may increase their risk of re-injury. So that's something we need to take into consideration. And keep in mind the career length for most professional athletes is really fairly short, right? So NFL players on average uh, have a mean career length of only 3.3 years. Now NHL and NBA a little bit longer at four and a half years um, and, and Major League Baseball uh, just a hair over five years. But in the grand scheme of things, this is a very uh, you know, short period of time. So players are often trying to you know, maximize their um, contributions and, and their um, playing time within the short potential time span that they have on the field. So that will kind of lead us into our first, uh, our first case here. Um, so this is a, a, a case, this isn't the actual athlete that was injured in this situation, but um, I'll show you an MRI shortly here of an NHL defenseman who blocked uh, a puck with his skate, right? So, um, at the Wells Fargo Center, a uh, player gets injured. They are then uh, brought um, into the tunnel, and we have a portable uh, x-ray unit um, to take x-rays immediately. So this is, uh, these are the x-rays for this, uh, for this uh, specific case. Um, you can see that the patient is imaged in skate, right? So the skate is left on. If we were to take off the skate, um, and the and the ankle were to blow up, then you know they'd have difficulty getting the skate back on. And so, oftentimes, for for hockey injuries, um, you know, particularly for the lower extremity, the skates are left on. Um, in this case, we don't see a fracture um, from what we can see through the you know overlying skate material here. So, uh, the next day, the patient uh, came to us for for an MRI, and we can see here. Um, intense bone marrow edema within the medial malleolus and overlying soft tissue edema, right? Where that puck impacted uh, the, you know, the inner aspect of the, of the uh, player's ankle here. We also see a big tibio Taylor joint effusion. And on our coronal T1 imaging, we see all of this T1 marrow hypo intensity. Um, and then on our coronal fluid sensitive sequence here, again, we see that severe osseous contusion at the medial malleolus. So this patient uh, then went on to CT and on CT, we don't see uh, any fracture, any discrete fracture, keeping in mind that we did see that uh, T1 marrow hypo intensity, which likely reflected the severity of the bone contusion, um, but no discrete cortical break in this case. So the question for uh, you guys is, and I'll give you a second to kind of log in here um, and, and answer this, how long will this player likely be out for? How long will this player likely be out for? Again, we have this severe contusion at the medium malleolus. And the answer in this case is probably somewhere between 10 and 30 days. Now, you know, you may not be familiar with that. You may not know that. And, and uh, this is something that we're, you know, still currently actively looking at um, uh, with a study that we've done looking at osseous contusions in uh, in players. So how do we determine return to play um, in this, you know, specific type of injury? Uh, you know, in a study that we did, basically, we took the date of the injury um, and the date of the first game back. Uh, and again, somewhere in between the patient, uh, the player had imaging uh, completed. And then we determined a return to play. Um, and we subsequently uh, graded the degree of osseous contusion. So I just want to show you a quick video here. This is kind of a you know, a, an example of how these severe contusions happen, right? See the slap shot from the point here, right on the inner aspect of that skate. And, uh, you know, this uh, particular player is not wearing skate guards, which many of the players don't really like because it 
they feel like it impedes their skating ability. Um, but that's how these, these uh, osseous contusions, which are usually related to puck injuries, sometimes slashing injuries, um, occur in hockey players. So in, in, in uh, one of our studies, we looked at bone bruise versus fracture. And the classic definition of a fracture is, is cortical disruption, right? We see a discrete cortical break on usually uh, x-ray imaging, certainly uh, on CT imaging. Um, and oftentimes we can also see a, a discrete fracture um, on MRI. But that begs the question, well, what's the difference between a fracture and a bone bruise, right? Because a bone bruise we think of essentially as subcortical microtrabecular fracture or disruption. Now that term really doesn't provide any useful information when we talk about a microtrabecular fracture, right? So we call these, these lesions bone bruises or osseous contusions, right? And they're characterized by bone marrow edema. And really, um, represent a spectrum of the same injury mechanism as fractures, right? So differentiation at MRI may be difficult, right? If there's a non-displaced fracture versus a severe contusion, it may be challenging to uh, determine that on, on an MRI. Um, oftentimes a CT will be ordered and, and uh, you know, if we don't uh, see a fracture on CT, then we would presume that there is no, um, no true cortical uh, fracture. Um, but then also, what is the clinical value of these terms, right? So if somebody has a severe contusion, is that really any different from having a non-displaced fracture? And in fact, um, as we'll see uh, on a subsequent slide here, it's probably, um, you know, really not very important whether or not there's a non-displaced fracture versus, versus a severe contusion. Um, and the clinical application of this research that we've been doing is, you know, essentially early MRI is important, obviously, in high-level athletes. Um, and useful potentially for predicting return to play. And therefore, if we quantify, quantify that bone marrow edema um, using uh, a grading system, we can potentially provide some clinically relevant uh, information. So um, this is just a grading system that we use for um, bone bruises uh, in uh, athletes. So um, grade one injuries are really defined by just mild edema in the bone, right? On average, um, in NHL players, that we see a return to play of around 2.8 days on average, right? So usually a couple of days and the player's back on the ice. Um, grade two injuries are more intermediate um, and focal uh, bone marrow edema without uh, corresponding T1 bone marrow replacement. And on average, those players are about, you know, four and a half days or so um, in terms of return to play. Now, where we really get into longer return to play is grade three injuries where we have intense bone marrow edema on T1 imaging. We see that uh, associated um, T1 marrow hypointensity. And then we also have a grade, essentially a grade three plus, right? A grade three with a discrete fracture as we see in this case here. And it, as it turns out, the return to play for uh, grade three and grade three plus fracture uh, cases um, are pretty similar, right? So about 18.3 days for grade three and about 21.4 days for grade three with a fracture. And, and in fact, there was no statistical difference between those two. So the player that um, I presented in the, you know, in the previous example had a grade three contusion. Um, so on average about 18 days, but you know, there is quite a bit of variability. So somewhere between, 20, uh, between 10 and 30 days, we would expect that player to, to return. These are just some more examples of uh, different contusions here, right? Contusion grade two uh, in the uh, navicular tuberosity. This player returned within four days. This player, grade three contusion at the navicular tuberosity. We see the associated intense marrow edema and also that T1 marrow hypointensity. And this player took 31 days to return. And lastly, we have another case here of a um, grade three contusion with a discrete fracture. And in fact, when we get the CT, we see there's a subtle, in this case, unicortical fracture at the posterior aspect uh, of the distal fibula. But this player returned within 26 days. So comparing this to the previous case without, um, without fracture, very similar. Um, in, in fact, this was a little bit quicker return to play. So um, that kind of uh, speaks to the fact that uh, severe contusions and, and fractures really behave very similarly. All right, we're going to move along to another interesting case here. Um, this is a, an NFL player who experienced acute uh, pain and bruising after making a tackle. So I'm just going to scroll through here. 
So this is an axial fluid sensitive sequence through the left chest wall. And this is a sagittal oblique sequence also through that chest wall. Um, which structure is torn here? So this is a C, a pectoralis major tendon tear. So in this case, on this uh, axial image here, we see designated by the arrow, the retracted pectoralis major tendon stump, which is um, completely ruptured uh, from the humeral attachment site. And in fact, we see uh, the lifting of that uh, long head biceps tendon off of the humerus with some interposed uh, fluid uh, and blood products there. So pectoralis major injuries. Um, the pectoralis major, uh, as I'm sure you are all familiar, is a large fan-shaped muscle. There are, in fact, three heads, the sternal head, the clavicular head, and the abdominal head. And really, the one that's most commonly injured is the sternal head. Um, pec injuries are usually acute, um, either related to contact sports or weightlifting injuries, in particular, uh, bench press. MRI is the gold standard, really, for imaging. But uh, ultrasound also has been shown to be useful for uh, diagnosing pectoralis muscle and uh, tendon uh, tears. Location of the tear is obviously important for both grading and management, right? So tears typically occur um, in one of three places, either at the tendon insertion, right? So either a tendon rupture at the humeral attachment site or an osseous avulsion at the humeral attachment site. At the myotendinous junction, right, where the muscle meets the tendon, or in the mid-muscle belly. Um, and muscle injuries, again, strains usually involve the sternal head. Uh, return to play is dependent on the grade of injury and whether or not the patient needs uh, surgical repair. Um, our chest wall protocol that we use at Jefferson is, uh, includes both large field of view coverage, and we wanna make sure that we include from uh, the midline chest all the way through the humerus, and also from the clavicle um, in the superior to inferior uh, direction, all the way from the clavicle through the mid-humeral shaft. Um, coil selection, usually we're using a surface array coil um, uh, with the patient in the supine position um, because most of these patients are fairly big um, and, it's, and they're best imaged uh, really in an open um, or wide bore, I, sh I should say, wide bore uh, closed uh, magnet. Sequences we obtain include axial uh, T1, axial stir, axial T2 weighted uh, sequences. And our coronal sequences uh, uh, performed in an oblique plane um, along um, or parallel to the fibers uh, or orientation of the pectoralis major and our sagittal oblique sequences performed uh, perpendicular to that. This is another case of a pectoralis injury. Um, we see here, a complete tear of the sternal uh, head at the distal myotendinous junction, right? So uh, that's designated by this arrow here. And at, at the arrow head, we see an intact tendon insertion uh, on the humeral, uh, proximal humerus. Um, so this is a myotendinous injury. In fact, on the T1 weighted sequence, we see some um, kind of ill-defined T1 hyperintense blood products within that torn muscle belly. And on our uh, coronal oblique sequence, um, we see, again see uh, very nicely the delineation of that um, sternal head above which sits the uh, clavicle head. And we see that at the distal myotendinous junction there, um, there's a complete tear uh, of that, uh, of that um, component. So the management is um, either operative or non-operative, right? So for most uh, complete, uh, i.e. full thickness tears um, involving the tendon, uh, or high-grade partial uh, tears um, involving uh, the tendon or um, uh, myotendinous junction tears, um, particularly in athletes, those are generally uh, repaired. Um, those are usually repaired fairly quickly as uh, chronic tears can really become difficult to repair um, with chronic retraction of the tendon um, as it uh, scars and fibrosis in place. Um, it's very hard to then mobilize that uh, tendon stump. Um, so these are typically repaired fairly quickly. Um, Non-operative management really is um, used for older patients uh, and patients with lower grade injuries, right? Lower grade strain injuries. And would include, you know, putting the person in a sling, um, 
you know, rest, NSAIDs, early physical therapy, that sort of thing. Low grade strains, usually the player's back within about a month or so. High grade injuries, if they're treated non operatively, um, high grade strain injuries, so grade two strains, um, about three to four months. And surgical uh, repair, um, once the, once the pectoralis tendon or myotendon junction is repaired, is usually about six months or so. Um, Post operative imaging, uh, so for a tendon repair, a tendon to bone repair, um, usually there's either a suture anchor fixation or a cortical button um, at the level of the proximal humerus. Um, you'll see susceptibility artifact in that region. And in this case, we see the um, tendon with surrounding susceptibility artifact uh, coming all the way across the bone here. So on MRI for follow up imaging, um, you know, we're looking for the uh, you know, the suture anchor to be covered by the tendon, uh, i.e. is the tendon still attaching to bone. Um, so if the repair failed at the repair site, um, you would see uncovering of that suture anchor uh, and or retraction of the, of the tendon stump. Um, is there injury at a new location, right? So suppose there was a, you know, a tendon repair, but um, a new strain injury, for example, at the myotendinous junction. And uh, to determine whether or not there is, a, you know, kind of an acute on chronic injury, you know, we'd look for muscle edema, any sort of associated intramuscular hematoma. And then in the chronic setting, we may see, um, you know, muscle atrophy. Other chest wall protocols that, you know, we'll often perform, um, you know, kind of tailored to the specific clinical question um, would include, for example, sternum uh, MRI. This was an NHL player with chest wall pain chest wall pain after being checked. We see a kind of a low grade sternoclavicular joint separation uh, injury here um, at the um, uh, you know, clavicle uh, articulation with the manubrium. We also see a pretty severe contusion of the manubrium with some surrounding soft tissue edema here. Um, but in this case, we did not uh, identify a fracture. Um, this is another interesting case. This was uh, obviously uh, a little bit different um, chest protocol. This was done as an MR uh, venogram. And um, this patient is, was a high school baseball pitcher who was complaining of kind of vague symptoms of hand pain, swelling, and numbness um, once, he, uh, once he was pitching past two innings. So as we scroll through here, the, the image on the left is um, a time of flight, um, I should say MRV, um, with the arm in the down position and, and the image on the right of your screen is the time of flight with the arm in the up uh, position, so above the patient's head. And we can see how the, um, how the vein here becomes completely slit-like and collapsed with the arm in the up position on the subclavian vein here. So um, this patient has venous thoracic outlet syndrome um, in the costoclavicular space. That's between the usually between the clavicle and subclavius muscle in the first rib. So the patient was referred to a, a vascular surgeon um, potentially to resect that first rib. So, um, you know, obviously the point is, is that we need to often tailor imaging um, to the specific clinical question. Just moving uh, here uh, a little more quickly. So this is a 21 year old collegiate football player with an ankle twisting injury two days ago. So I'm just going to scroll through this. We have a, a coronal fluid sensitive sequence, an axial fluid sensitive sequence, and, uh, and an axial non, uh, non fat suppressed uh, fluid sequence. All right. So the question is what is the most appropriate management of this patient? All right. It should be a pretty quick answer. And then when you advance, I think they might be able to see him. Excellent. All right. So what is the most appropriate management for this patient? Is it ankle arthroplasty, tight rope surgery, cast immobilization, or rest, ice, compression, elevation, rice? And the answer, um, as some of you may be familiar with, is tight rope surgery. Right, so this patient has a high ankle sprain, um, in this case, a severe high ankle sprain injury with a uh, widening of the syndesmosis and complete rupture of the syndesmotic ligaments. So high ankle sprain injuries is a term you should be familiar with um, if you're involved in sports imaging. Um, high ankle sprain injuries refer to injuries of the ankle syndesmosis 
i.e. the distal tibiofibular ligaments. They are uh, termed as such because they're higher in location than a, your typical lateral ankle sprain um, that would involve, for example, the ATFL or CFL. Um, these are uh, obviously higher up at the level of the syndesmosis. The main anatomic components of the syndesmotic uh, uh, ligament complex includes the AITFL, the PITFL, and the interosseous membrane. Um, there's also an inferior transverse ligament here. Um, but uh, the AITFL really is the one that's most uh, commonly injured. This case on the right of your screen here demonstrates a little bit lower grade um, high ankle sprain injury in which we have some uh, tearing um, of the uh, anterior syndesmotic ligament uh, and interosseous membrane, as well as um, some periosteal stripping here um, at the level of the syndesmosis. So uh, these um, injuries are often uh, diagnosed clinically with uh, you know, tenderness um, with a Hopkins squeeze test, which is, you know, squeezing uh, the, the lower extremity at the level of um, the level of the, just above the syndesmosis, usually at the level of the calf. Imaging really first line is um, x-rays, um, which uh, may in severe cases demonstrate widening of the syndesmosis like that first MRI I showed you. Um, but oftentimes uh, MRI is necessary to make the diagnosis. Now with um, you know, kind of chronic injuries, you may see ossification along the interosseous membrane there. That is um, essentially uh, you know, diagnostic of a, a prior high ankle sprain injury. Um, management may be operative or non-operative, and that's depending on if the injury is unstable um, or if there are concurrent fractures and certainly if there's syndesmotic widening and diastasis. Um, it's uh, a, a good rule of thumb that um, return to play is usually about two times longer than quote unquote low ankle sprains, right? So like sprains at ATFL, CFL, that sort of thing. Um, high ankle sprains are usually about twice as long um, stable injuries are immobilized with a cam boot, usually for about two to three weeks, although that can be pretty variable. Sometimes it takes much longer in certain individuals. Um, and for unstable injuries, uh, surgical repair is obviously um, required. Um, and uh, tight, now tightrope surgery is preferred to screw fixation. Um, and in fact, tightrope um, surgery probably has a, a little bit uh, quicker return to play. Um, and also has some other benefits, which I'll, um, which I'll get into in a subsequent slide. So again, the AITFL is most frequently uh, injured. Other associated injuries you want to look for would be uh, fractures of the distal fibula, usually Weber B or C fractures, Taylor dome, osteochondral lesion, perineal tendon injury on, uh, on MRI. And long-term complications of high ankle sprains would include accelerated tibiotalar joint OA and then uh, synostosis of the uh, distal tibia fibular um, join here. So you, synostosis essentially meaning um, that there's a uh, bone bridging those two bones now. Um, you can see this case here was fixed. This was a little bit of an older individual, certainly not an athlete, and this um, patient was uh, fixated with multiple plate and screw constructs and a, and a screw traversing um, the syndesmosis here, which, you know, essentially limits uh, mobility across that synde syndesmosis, and it will ultimately form a synostosis. The tightrope implant system is um, uh, basically something that was uh, developed by Arthrex, which uses a fiber wire suture um, and some metallic buttons. And that stabilizes the syndesmosis, but still allows a little bit of motion. So um, the benefit of that is um, there's not risk for, um, you know, many athletes will, if they were to be fixed with um, a plate and screw fixation, uh, would end up with a screw fracture um, just because they're constantly stressing uh, the syndesmosis there. Um, and again, there's a potentially earlier return to play. Um, and certainly um, uh, there's not a need to remove uh, hardware um, when you're just putting in these fiber wire sutures. So um, that's the benefit of, uh, of this system. All right, um, on to our next case. This is a 26 year old lineman who caught uh, his foot on a plane surface. So I'm just going to scroll through here. This is a sagittal image through the great toe. This is our long axis image through the forefoot here. And lastly, we have a short axis. This is a uh, T2 sequence without fat suppression. 
Okay, so the question is, what is the diagnosis? And I'll give you guys a bit of time here to respond. All right, so the answer in this case is B, a turf toe turf toe injury, right? So turf toe injuries refer to injuries uh, to the plantar plate of the great toe. Um, the anatomy of the plantar plate of the great toe is a little bit different from the lesser um, MTP joints, uh, right? But um, the main components here are the sesamoid phalangeal ligaments, which there's both medial and lateral sesamoid phalangeal ligaments. And that connects the either the tibial or the fibular hallux sesamoid um, to the proximal phalanx base. There's also an intersesamoidal ligament. And we also have the distal flexor hallucis brevis muscles that attach to the proximal aspect of both uh, sesamoids. And this is a nice graphic um, from uh, one of the web clinics at Radshorse, which, uh, which are uh, excellent if you haven't checked them out. But um, really a nice depiction of the, uh, the various anatomical structures here that can potentially be injured in a turf toe injury. Um, clinical exam, you know, the player often has difficulty extending the great toe and inability to bear weight and, uh, and they can't push off uh, with that foot. Um, so uh, again, this is a hyperextension injury of the first plantar plate. And, uh, and the case that I just showed you, um, there was a, a complete rupture of the um, medial sesamoid phalangeal ligament and also a partial tear of the lateral sesamoid phalangeal ligament. Um, turf toe injuries are uh, usually first line imaged with radiographs, but radiographs are often insensitive. You may see displacement of the sesamoids. This is a patient with a chronic plantar plate um, injury. In fact, this is an NFL player with uh, the sesamoids both proximally retracted here really quite significantly with respect to the first metatarsal head. Um, but this was, you know, a chronic injury, so there's not really much to do. Um, MRI really gives us a much better detailed, uh, evaluation of the anatomy, allows us to identify injured structures and also grade severity of the injury, which will then determine treatment and return to play. So, um, this MRI here on the bottom right is a, a chronic turf toe injury. We see really significant thickening, um, of that medial uh, sesamoid phalangeal ligament. Um, so this was kind of an acute on chronic type, um, injury. Uh, you can see the, the skin marker here, but, um, you know, this, this player's, uh, medial sesamoid ligament, uh, obviously looks, um, significantly abnormal, but is not, you know, completely disrupted. Grade one injuries are low grade sprains, right? So they're return to play as tolerated, um, usually fairly quick. Grade two injuries would, um, include partial tears of the plantar plate, right? Any of the plantar plate structures. And those are treated with either a walking boot um, or a Morton's extension orthotic. And return to play for those uh, injuries are usually about uh, two weeks with taping, right? So when the patient uh, returns, they're gonna have their foot taped um, uh, while uh, performing on the field. Grade three turf toe injuries really require long-term immobilization. Surgery is not typically um, performed for these, but obviously if the injury is refractory to conservative treatment, um, or if there's a significant sesamoid retraction uh, or associated intraarticular loose bodies or, or an osteochondral lesion, um, they may uh, require surgery. And obviously the return to play for surgery is significantly longer, about three to four months. Whereas if this is treated conservatively with taping, um, it's more along the lines of six to 10 weeks um, uh, but obviously depends on the player position and the requirements of that position, um, with respect to putting, um, uh, um, you know, stress on the forefoot. All right. We've got a couple more cases here. This is a 25 year old NFL wide receiver with an acute lower abdominal strain after a tackle. What is the diagnosis? I'll give you guys about 15 seconds here to uh, respond. I think this one's tough because uh, we haven't really published it yet. Yeah, so this is a, this is a good case. Your, your, uh, your um, options are muscle contusion, apophysitis, 
side strain or hip pointer. All right, and the answer is in fact hip pointer. So um, this is a really nice example of a hip pointer and a hip pointer is a term that's often used um, by the you know, uh, team physicians and the athletic trainers, um, but not so much in the radio radiology literature, right? So what is a hip pointer? In sports medicine, that indicates trauma to the iliac crest. Usually it occurs during contraction of the abdominal muscles. And you can see here some, uh, some images of uh, how a hip pointer may occur, right? So a, patient, a player lowers their helmet um, and impacts their helmet right on the iliac crest. And that uh, really has very minimal protection um, and uh, results in contusion of the soft tissues and usually injury of the lower abdominal muscles. Um, in the previous case, we had a pretty severe injury in which the lower abdominal muscles were essentially avulsed and retracted from the iliac crest. Uh, most of these uh, type of injuries are treated non-operatively with uh, you know, either rest or steroid injection or stretching and physical therapy, although some may um, undergo uh, like a core muscle um, repair. Clinically, I mean, there's often really extensive bruising along the iliac crest. Um, again, the uh, the um, impetus for, uh, for the study that Adam was referring to was a situation in which, um, you know, the, he was, I think, talking with one of the uh, team physicians and um, was explaining all of these muscle tears and, and the uh, team doc was like, oh, let's say uh, you're talking about hip pointer. So um, that, that was the impetus for this, uh, for this study in which we really um, kind of delve into the imaging findings of what is it actually a hip pointer. Um, again, I kind of described this before, but muscle strain or contusion, usually involving the internal or external obliques and the transversus abdominis muscles, um, often there's associated either muscle, again, strain or contusion or frank muscle tearing um, in which you can have fiber retraction with more severe injuries. And in such cases, there's always uh, an accompanying hematoma kind of filling that gap. Um, Return to play is quite variable, right? It can range from a few games to several weeks or months, depending on the grade of injury um, and severe injuries in the study um, that, uh, that um, Adam um, and, and some of our fellows were involved in really showed that severe injuries are much more likely to, end, uh, to be season ending. Um, when the player does return to play, of course, they'll require additional padding over that iliac crest region. But the interesting thing about um, this study wa was one, um, more uh, common activities were in football, but also some injuries seen in hockey, basketball, and baseball. And out of the 45 injuries that were identified describing these muscle tears, zero of the reports used the term hip pointer, right? So that's kind of speaks to uh, radiology's uh, unfamiliarity with that term. And so it's, uh, you know, it's important for us to start kind of speaking the language of athletic trainers and, and integrating these um, sort of um, descriptions into our, our reporting. Um, this is just a, a quick breakdown of the grading scheme that they came up with here, but basically grade one, low grade injuries where there's just some mild muscle strain or contusion, grade two injuries where there's partial tearing of those muscles, and grade three injuries where there's really extensive uh, tearing with fiber retraction. And this is another case of a grade two um, injury here uh, in a, an NBA player, actually, who had a rotational injury. So you see that there's some partial uh, tearing of, uh, of the lower abdominal musculature at the iliac crest attachment site. All right, this is our last case here. We'll try and get through this quickly. Um, I know it's getting late. So um, this is a 16-year-old wrestler with an elbow injury during a match three days ago. All right, so the question is what structure is torn? And again, I'll give you guys about 15 seconds here.
All right, and the answer is B, the UCL, right? So this is a complete tear of the proximal UCL, which in this case is distally retracted. Um, these, Im these types of injuries are fairly common in, um, in wrestlers due to, uh, you know, the arm uh, being uh, put into an arm bar. Um, but more commonly, we see them in, in the uh, professional baseball players, um, in particular uh, pitchers, right? So um, the UCL is the primary restraint to valgus forces at the elbow. There's uh, three bundles. The most important one you want to keep in mind is the anterior bundle. That's the one we see best on MRI um, and really is most important functionally. Um, there are anterior and posterior components or bands of the anterior bundle, um, but you can't resolve those well by MRI. Although sometimes um, we can see tearing maybe involving either the anterior or posterior component um, specifically. Um, and again, uh, the uh, UCL is a uh, valgus restraint um, that's a static restraint, right? And which works in conjunction with the overlying uh, common flexor pronator uh, tendon, which serves as a, you know, a more of a dynamic um, restraint. UCL tears can either be um, proximal, distal, or occasionally mid-substance. Um, partial tearing distally or stripping from the sublime tubercles has been called the T-sign. You may hear that uh, uh, on MR arthrography. Um, and uh, again, MR arthrography is really the gold standard for imaging suspected UCL injuries. Um, although in our professional baseball players, we always use a combined MRI uh, arthrogram plus ultrasound um, for evaluation. And that gives the added benefit of doing dynamic imaging um, with ultrasound to um, assess for not only the morphologic appearance of the uh, UCL, but also abnormal gapping of the ulnohumeral joint with uh, application of valgus forces. Um, so we can actually detect um, that abnormality with, uh, with dynamic ultrasonography. Um, treatment for UCL tears is either conservative or operative reconstruction. And that may depend on not only the uh, imaging findings, but also um, the role of the athlete, right? So if it's a pitcher um, and they have a high grade injury, they're usually gonna have operative reconstruction. Um, if it's a, an NFL lineman, um, they may be treated conservatively because they're not torquing um, you know, the, uh, the UCL as much um, with their, uh, their specific um, you know, play. So that's very important to keep in, the, um, in consideration. Return to play um, follows the performance practice play sequence, right? So the, the player uh, returns to performance activities um, practices, and then ultimately returns to play. Um, conservative uh, treatment is quite variable for return to play, right? On average, players, um, uh, MLB players return um, with partial, partial UCL tears or st uh, sprain injuries return on average in about four months. Um, for surgery, usually 90% return to their pre-injury level of play, but it does take significantly uh, longer, usually about 12 months or so. Um, but, you know, certainly some patients may need to undergo surgery if they have, um, you know, instability at the medial aspect of the elbow, um, complete UCL tears or high grade partial tears. This is just an image of a UCL reconstruction here, uh, also called a Tommy John surgery. We see a nice intact UCL graft here, very robust. Um, and, uh, and containing the intraarticular contrast for this arthrogram. I'm not gonna belabor this point. This is just kind of reviewing some of the anatomy here. So again, at the medial aspect of the elbow, we have the UCL, which uh, is um, covered more superficially by the common flexor uh, pronator tendon origin. Arthrography, usually I'm uh, doing these as a posterior trans triceps approach. We just put a very small gauge hypodermic through the triceps directly into that olecranon fossa and um, very easily distend the joint here. The radio capitella approach can also be used. It's uh, you know sometimes a little bit more tricky to uh, to fit the needle in through the radio capitella joint and uh, and avoid injecting the common extensor tendon. So my uh, personal preference is this posterior approach. Um, this is just an overview of our typical arthrogram protocol, but I'm just going to skip along here. Um, this is a case of a 22-year-old collegiate right-hand pitcher with um, 
you know, medial elbow pain for about a month, felt a pop while pitching. And in this case, we have a high grade partial tear um, of the proximal UCL. And that's predominantly involving the posterior component of the anterior bundle here. So we see the anterior uh, most fibers of that um, anterior bundle still intact, but the posterior aspect of those um, anterior bundle fibers are torn. And again, this is just uh, kind of delineating that anatomy. Now, again, we can't often really resolve these two bands of the anterior bundle um, by imaging, but we can um, make an educated guess here based on um, the location of that tear. Again, distal UCL tears, you may see either a complete tear distally at the sublime tubercle or on the case on the right, a partial thickness uh, undersurface or stripping type tear, um, which has again been called the T sign. Just keep in mind that sometimes a T sign in asymptomatic uh, you know, players um, or players uh, who maybe don't have any sort of uh, medial elbow instability, um, that may represent just a variant distal insertion of the anterior bundle. So it's important to keep um, keep that in mind, take that into consideration with the clinical uh, features and also um, the ultrasound findings. This is just kind of, uh, you know, a, a little uh, picture here of Adam and, and Lev Nazarian doing a, uh, an example, ultrasound examination of the UCL while applying a valgus force. Um, and this is what it looks like on ultrasound, right? So at rest, we see the, the, um, uh, ulnal humeral uh, uh, gap here is normal. And then with stress that really widens up. Um, so a greater than one millimeter difference side to side, right? So that the um, throwing in, in the case of a baseball player, the throwing arm versus the non-throwing arm um, is uh, fairly um, specific and very sensitive for detection of um, UCL instability. Um, and also the degree of gapping can help uh, predict the need for UCL reconstruction. That was um, published by uh, one of our, one of our um, colleagues, Johannes and, and uh, Adam and, and Bill um, a few years back. So um, keep in mind, chronic UCL injuries can also demonstrate ligament calcification or ossification. So you may see that both on x-ray and on, uh, on ultrasound here um, with a, a little shadowing focus um, a hyperechoic focus within the ligament. This is just a, a video here demonstrating abnormal gapping of the ulnar humeral uh, joint at the medial elbow with application of valgus force and the corresponding MRI here, which shows high grade partial tearing um, and also some partial undersurface tearing um, distally, but high grade partial tearing of the proximal uh, UCL. This patient went on for uh, UCL reconstruction. All right, so what are the take-home points here? Um, again, just kind of uh, to, to uh, revisit those intro slides, the availability and responsiveness of the radiologist is, is, and, and the imaging resources is really key um, you know, to providing adequate uh, care of, of these professional athletes. Um, consider assigning an athlete imaging manager, so somebody um, who is uh, available, uh, affable, and has uh, the ability um, to serve as, as such, uh, and delineate clear lines of communication with your athletic training staff, your uh, team physicians, um, and any uh, you know, consultants that may be involved in the player's care. Um, you wanna tailor both your imaging uh, and reporting to both the scenario and the athlete, right? So speak the language um, of athletic trainers, of ATs. Um, you know, talk to them in a language in which they're going to understand what you're saying, um, you know, what you're seeing on the, uh, on the imaging and establish yourself as part of, as part of the organizational medical team. And if you're asked, can you see this or can you treat this? Um, most often your answer is going to want to be yes, absolutely. Um, so, uh, with that, um, I'll just, uh, you know, open things up for a quick uh, question slash uh, panel discussion here. All right, let's see. I answered a few of uh, the questions on the chat. Jeff, sorry, I had to, I had to change. I want to go be an athlete here in a few minutes. Um, <laughs> I will tell you, though, uh, I mean, Jeff's point about the radiologist really has to serve as everything 
when it comes to an athlete is absolutely true. And in some, uh, on, you know, often these, uh, these imaging studies are asked for on weekends and off hours. Last weekend was a holiday, right? M many people consider it a holiday. Our outpatient imaging center where we generally image the athletes was closed on Sunday for the holiday. And of course, there's a visiting team in town and they got beaten up on uh, Saturday night and they needed three MRIs Sunday. That was an all day affair. I had to register the patients. I had to get the patients to the scanner. I had to uh, teach the technologists how to burn a CD. I had to get the images to the professional league database. It's not just interpreting them. Yeah, and I really think that speaks to kind of the nature of providing the elite level care, you know, when you're, when you're living in the, oh, maybe I think I want to do this world. Like it seems very cool. And, and, you know, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of fun parts, but it is an incredible, incredible amount of work. Um, and, and it's a, it's a, what can you do for me now, not later world. And so you have to be prepared uh, for that across the board. Um, you know, weekends, nights, uh, doesn't matter you know it, what there's money on the line and wins and losses and so you have to be prepared for that um and uh you know you used to it after a while but it, it is it is difficult at times um and that you know that's why i think we, it's important we all we all have to work together you know like the the athletic trainers are calling the physicians and the physicians are calling the radiologists the radiologist schedulers and and, and like now that has to happen like in a re really rapid fashion um, and so I think it's so important, as, as Jeff said, like having established, okay, <clears throat> game Sunday, it's over at, you know, four o'clock post game triage of injuries and, um, MRIs are being, you know, doled out already. Like what's, what's going to happen next morning at 9am, you know, and if you don't have those things in place, like it just, th if things that get delayed, you know, agents or agents are already calling. And um, it just creates a, 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 a tangent that you have to, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. And so having all those pieces in place is really important. Yeah, you can't perseverate. At some point, Steve's gonna have to meet with the general manager the next morning. So Steve can't go up to meet with the general manager with no report. If he does, we're pretty useless. So we gotta be attentive. We gotta pick up the phone all the time. Yeah. And Steve calls, I pick up. Yeah. All right text him to call jeff yeah. <laughs> or, or i know when adam's away and i'm just calling jeff anyway um but i, I you know like I, I grew up in the jefferson world and i can't uh, you know you guys have always been so affable and available it's it's, it's really an impressive system and, and you know it's, it's always reflect like uh, you know life is tough it's hard uh I wonder what things are like elsewhere and then I, these are the things that i start to think about like what would i do without adam zoga or what would I do without uh, Johannes Rodel? And so, um, you know, your, your services are valued beyond just your eyeballs looking at the, uh, looking at the reports or looking at the studies and generating reports. But I um, wanted to make a comment. I think one of the things that um, Jeff highlighted earlier is the, the opportunity to really create um, uh, an impact in, in your, in the, in the both worlds by collaborating between sports medicine and radiology, you know, um, we use athlete care often as a gold standard of like, what do you get to do when you have all the resources and all the money? And so, you know, you get players that have serial MRIs and things over time that really allow us to then produce the research that can create standards for grading systems. And, and I, I think that that's a unique opportunity that comes with, with this level of care. Um, that being said, um, sometimes it's really hard to extrapolate some of the information that we gather and can put in place to make medical decisions for professional athletes to the general population. And so if you're listening to this lecture, like it's really cool, it's really great information. There's a lot of research, which is be very critical when you're transitioning from discussing things uh, with regards to how you would do, uh, you know, or, or guide a return to play process um, for a professional athlete versus your average weekend warrior who also has a nice medial malleolus contusion because they got hit on the rink on a Thursday night while they had a couple of beers between periods. Um, that guy's going to not necessarily respond the same. And so, you know, if you're talking to your sports medicine staff, um, you have to keep that in mind. 
Right. Yeah, absolutely. The motivations for a professional athlete returning are very different from a weekend warrior, which are also different from a collegiate athlete, right? Who has their whole career in front of them. I can't tell you how many times, like I get a call from Adam and it's like, the report is just like devastating. There's like so much edema. And I look at a guy on Monday and he's like, eh, I'm okay. I think I can play next week. Like, okay. <laughs> Right. I hadn't heard of the Hopkins. Uh, I hadn't heard of the Hopkins squeeze test before, Jeff. Is that is that to be clear? Is that when you uh, squeeze a Hopkins player and uh, count how long it takes for them to drop the ball? <laughs> yeah. We don't drop the ball. We just score uh, goals and touchdowns, especially when we uh, play our sinus. So you know, it's, it's that is correct. Yeah. Um, I wanted to make one more comment. It's actually a question. I, you know, I think it's an interesting discussion. Um, we just had our sports medicine conference. And uh, one of the things that I see kind of outside of the Philadelphia area is uh, the explosion of um, sports medicine doctors having ultrasounds in their hand. And, you know, I, I have colleagues in the Philadelphia area that definitely do it. But, you know, personally, I rely upon your guys' expertise. So how do you see that relationship evolving with your training versus my training because when i'm counseling my residents and fellows i'm looking at them saying like mosquito cell radiologists are the gold standard and so if you want to be on par like you got to be able to do what they do and so i'd be interested to hear what your perspective is on on the other side yeah that hits close to home and for these guys for this audience i think that the important thing is for us to push the envelope Right. So we have leaders like John Jacobson and Lev Nazarian, and uh, we have people that are really pushing the envelope like uh, Johannes Rodell. Um, we're not going to take the ultrasound probes away from the sports medicine docs, but we can be better at it than they are so that the higher end studies, the intricate injections, the injections that have to be perfect, the um, the more, um, you know, the tenotomies, we can still do that work and support what the sports medicine docs have already done. I don't think we should be fighting for this turf. I think we should be growing this turf. Yeah, and I think that the, the, the exact same is being said on, on our end. And I think that there has, over time, like with most things, there, there'll be, you know, kind of a delineation. But um, I was like pretty impressed. I actually reached out to Johannes on the stuff that I'm seeing that some of the outside, the, the comment that I think you need to be, that I wanted to make that you need to be aware of is, is know your, know your demographic, know the programs that you're applying to and what the, what the environment is, because I think one of the steepest learning curves that you'll find when you're, you're getting into a subspecialty niche where you have professional uh, or even collegiate is, is, is staying in your lane. Like it's really important and lanes will be different in different cities. And so that's something that you got to start to think about um on where you see your role because uh, you want to be part of the team but you want to make the team work and so everybody works together absolutely all right i'll just also mention that um uh, okay there's a question here for steve can you talk a little bit more about treating patients with imaging findings worse than presenting symptoms how can we as radiologists help your approach I think being available to uh, have the discussion, because I think it, that, that, that's a, a situation that cuts both ways. Like we'll have people that clinically, um, they seem like they should be fine, but their images are bad. And then it's a risk stratification system where you're like trying to decide, you know, is this guy, like, is he just want to play that badly? Like, is he gonna, you know, classic is like grade two ACL spray and we were like one, plant away from complete rupture but it's week 17 and playoffs are on the line like that's a situation that could go just horribly wrong but at the same time like if that guy's not on the field to to help the team win like that's a net so so it's it's really important to be available and then when it's the flip when when you're seeing someone that has um, really bad clinical symptoms, but the imaging isn't there. Like that's, that's where you, you got to look at the app, you know, like I'm looking at the athletic trainer saying like, what's this guy's deal? Like, do you know, like I talked to the radiologist and like scan does not look bad. Um, what was, is there some, some sort of secondary gain here? 
um, which again, just echoes the, the collaboration and the discussion. You have to have that trusted relationship kind of from the, from the boots on the ground with the trainers all the way to the reading room. Yeah, absolutely. And we didn't even talk about cardiac. Steve has to deal with all the cardiac issues in athletes, which, whew, that's a, Love that's a whole nother cardiac problem. MRI. It's just get them, everybody. Yeah. Whole different topic, whole different topic. Well, thank you for everyone for attending tonight. Um, I want to remind everyone that the next lecture is May 18th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it's Financial Healthcare Economics Introduction by Dr. Travis Hilton from uh, Washington U University, St. Louis. Um, hope to see you all there. Yeah, and uh, again, thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Zoga and Dr. Stash for joining. I think our uh, discussion was excellent and uh, really appreciate you guys weighing in. I also did want to remind everyone to uh, just complete a brief survey if you have a minute, um, just to help us, uh, um, you know, guide future uh, webinars and, uh, and, you know, tell us what you liked or what you didn't like about, uh, about the format here. But uh, thanks everyone for joining. We really appreciate it and uh, we'll see you next time.